it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Angeliki Lazaridou, who, uh, who is uh, the researcher at uh, Google DeepMind. Uh, she has done her PhD uh, with Marco Baroni at the University of Trento. She's doing very interesting work on uh, neural networks and uh, multi-agent communication and uh, emerging languages. But as we said earlier in the morning, we won't be saying that much about the speakers because they are amazing and you should go to their home pages and check out all the great papers they've written. And we pass the microphone to Angeliki. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas, for this really nice introduction. Uh -huh. It was all true, all true. Hi, I'm Angeliki. I come from London. I work at DeepMind. Um, I just want to say like um, two things about myself. I did my, uh, b before joining DeepMind, uh, that was like around three years ago. Uh, before that, I did my PhD with Marco Baron in the uh, University of Trento, um, where I studied um, language learning and um, emergent communication, which is what I'm going to talk about here. Before that, I did um, my, master's, my master's degree in uh, Zalbrücken, where I worked um, with Ivan Titov on sentiment analysis. And before that, I did my bachelor's right here, um, right here in the University of Athens. And I actually did my uh, bachelor thesis in Democritus, um, not in this actual building, but uh, here working with uh, Georgios Pajuras. So I'm extremely excited to be here today after all these years. I'm not going to say how many years though. Um, and I want to talk to you today about the kind of things that I'm doing currently. Um, I've never given a talk at a summer school, I've never given a talk at, at a school, S and the organizers told me that I should talk about um, something related to my work. I was going to talk about one of my recent papers, but I changed my mind. Um, so I'm going to talk about something else. Instead of talking about one specific paper, um, given the spirit that this is a school, I want to take a step back and talk about um, the field of multi-agent communication, this emerging field, and try in this um, hour that is left to make you as excited as I am about this field. Um, I don't know how you do it here with questions, but if you have any questions, maybe I can take them uh, during the talk just to make sure that um, I don't bottleneck your understanding. And okay, and let's see what we can do. So the field of multi-agent communication um, tries to answer the question of how does an effective communication system arise among a collection of initially non-communicating individuals. So the idea is that we have a couple of agents and um, we let them talk, talk to each other and then we see what comes out. And that's basically a caricature of the field. The field is slightly more complicated than that. Now, this being 2019, um, when we usually talk about um, non-communicating individuals, we actually talk about uh, agents parametrized by neural networks. So this whole field is about having neural networks talk to each other. Now, I want to talk a bit about why would we like to do that? Why do we want to study multi-agent communication? And Interestingly, there is not actually, there are plenty of reasons why multi-agent communication is a, um, is a very exciting framework, at least for me. Um, first of all, a multi-agent communication framework can be used as a way, as an experimental framework for us to study questions related to language emergence and evolution. So for example, if we have a hypothesis about how language has evolved, and there are many hypotheses out there actually, and we don't yet seem to have a good answer, we can simulate a community of agents and we can test our hypothesis and see um, whether um, the hypotheses are validated under the particular experimental setup that we are following. Another reason why we, we might want to adopt the multi-agent framework is as a way um, to do, langu to do uh, language learning. It allows us to bring interaction into language learning. For example, we can think of two agents, both having some basic language, uh, natural language skills, and then letting those two agents interact with each other. That can be a basis for an interactive language learning um, framework. 
um, I have to say very much um, in line with the kind of uh, the kinds of ideas that Wittgenstein had about how um, language learning should be learned. But anyway. Um, and uh, another reason why multi-agent communication uh, might be handy is because in general it can facilitate knowledge, knowledge transfer and coordination among um, a society of agents. So let's say for example that we want to have an application and this application consists of multiple agents, then allowing those agents to communicate uh, might result in better coordination and achieving this collective task in a better way. So, as you can see, what is interesting with this framework is, is that it doesn't only allow us to answer very core scientific questions, for example, about um, regarding language evolution, but it also let us study more, um, more engineering questions, like how can we get agents to better coordinate to solve a task? And that's actually something that, that fascinates me, really. Um, and perhaps what is um, also more interesting is that all these different facets of multi-agent communication are not really separate, but they are rather very interconnected. And we constantly see ideas floating from one domain to another, um, which, is, which is very exciting. So currently, for example, we see that many people that are actually working on, um, on, on, the, on the top left thing, the coordination among agents, the very engineering questions, they are getting inspired and about how to, go, how to go about solving these problems from the work that people have been doing in the language evolution. Okay, so and now I want to take a bit and talk, um, give use cases for each of these different facets. Language evolution, language emergence, how did language come about to have the properties that it has? We don't really know. We have plenty of hypotheses out there, and as you can see, a number of very, very clever people have formed their own theories about um, what has happened. Um, here, I order these theories uh, in, in inverse order with their plausibility. Um, so basically, what many theories, many theories, really. Um, and Perhaps the property of the language that has attra attracted the biggest attention is uh, the hierarchical nature of the language, the fact that language is compositional, um, that the fact that the meaning of the whole is a combination of the meaning of its parts and the way they combine. And the, people, and the reason why people have gotten so excited about this particular property of language is because it, it sets apart natural language from other types of communication found, for example, in animal communication. And moreover, it, it's, very, it's a very powerful property that allows us to make use of finite means, for example, the words, to produce infinite meanings. Um, and it's this property, for example, that people wanted to try to understand how it came about. In the literature of uh, language evolution, people wanted to study compositionality, so they wanted to try to come a bit closer uh, to some answers. And in, in their case, they didn't really um, try to answer the whole question, so how, like, address the whole full-blown hierarchical um, nature of compositionality, but they restricted a bit their problem. So when they talk about, for example, composition, compositional versus non-compositional or holistic um, protocols, they consider the following two cases. As holistic protocols, they consider protocols that they don't have an internal structure. For example, here we can see that um, all, the proper, all, all the objects on the third row, although they are all dotted, they don't have any uh, commonality on the, on the way they are written. So they assume this is a holistic protocol. Whereas with the compositional protocols, uh, they would mean something like um, um, a word has internal structure. For example, in this case, um, the third row, all the dotted um, uh, objects have the same suffix, woo. And uh, starting from this, they wanted to see what are the, how can they 
make a frame or how can they make um, an experiment to see what, um, what, what gives rise to compositional rather than holistic protocols. The first way that people um, started looking at these questions through communication was actually not with, hum not, not with computers, but with humans. So usually they would go into the lab uh, and they would conduct, um, they would conduct ex experiments to study uh, emergent communication by giving um, uh, to participants um, by starting basically from a setup where there were no um, pre-established linguistic conventions. There is a series of um, all these studies and all experiments of this form, but crucially, um, this, very, this, this very setup of having um, two humans communicating without having pre-established linguistic communications gave rise um, in, back in the 90s in the very first uh, computer simulations of um, of emergent communication. Um, I'm, here I'm going to describe um, two of these works. Um, the first one um, is a computer simulation um, that is following the, observ the observational learning paradigm. Uh, and it studies the hypothesis of whether or not cultural, transmissions, ca cultural transmission between agents gives rise to more structured um, communication. So in this multi-agent communication experiment, again back in the 90s, um, the, um, the story would go like this. They would have a population of agents. These were actually back then neural networks, but very simple neural networks. Um, there was a speaker and a listener. The speaker would uh, take as input um, a symbolic representation of a phrase um, uh, and code it in, bin in binary vectors. The speaker would create a message using um, the neural network, like the RNN, for example, in the case of Batali. Uh, the, the speaker would create a message, and then the listener would take the message, and we had to decode um, the, um, the observation of the speaker, the phrase of the speaker. Um, the learning would consist then in the listener trying to optimize this similarity, and the idea then would be um, after the whole training has happened, um, the idea would be then to look at the messages and see whether these messages give rise to some internal structure. And this is cultural transmission because when the listener learns, the listener becomes the speaker to a new listener, and then they form this uh, chain of, um, of speakers listeners from one generation to another. Back in the 90s, it's very important to, to remember that. Another type of research um, back in the 90s is going away from this ob observational paradigm that I showed before in which only the listener would, uh, would learn and now has two agents, again the same, a speaker and a listener, um, but now both of these agents are learning. So very, very similar to reinforcement learning, but not quite. Um, so the idea here is that, again, the speaker takes as input um, some observation, it encodes it into, the, into a message, the listener takes the message and tries to decode the right observation. And then we can learn um, both the listener and the speaker. And this is the idea then of language game. So the idea that we can have two agents that they have to solve a common task. Here the common task is for the listener to decode the observation of the speaker. Um, and then through this language game, we see um, an, a language emerging. And this language is really uh, the message generated by the speaker. So this is another paradigm that we can then do, and then again go back and look at the messages, whether or not the messages have an internal structure. Um, as you notice, this is older work. This is pre-2015 work, so you know it belongs to the uh, <laughs> to the past, um, but if you are more interested in, in this, I, I, you should have a look at this review um, where they discuss similar experiments along these lines with neural networks. So this is like a very interesting line of research, um, simple experiments, but really, uh, really important questions. Um, and really, all, the, all this work lays the groundwork for multi-agent communication today. 
actually we see that some of these works, uh, some of this work is now again getting, um, has started being citing. People are interested about the type of experiments that people were using, the type of uh, questions that people were asking. So we see now people again going back into this. Um, however, as I said, this work, this very interesting work, uh, was in 1995, 1998, early 2000. Um, people didn't have very powerful neural networks, so all of the experiments, while they were asking very crucial questions, all of the stimuli and all of the materials were very um, impoverished. So they were looking, for example, in input representations that were extremely symbolic. And although this is a good way to start re uh, getting into this field, there is a big disconnect between studying language emergence with those type of, of stimuli and trying to answer questions about language emergence when we know that humans actually perceive the world um, as my robot friends here. So it's, it's questionable whether or not we are actually able to, whether we are actually able to transfer any of the conclusions from um, one type of rock to another. A middle ground, of course, is to, um, to not consider symbolic input, um, to not consider all the cuts in the world, but rather um, play, for example, with, um, with real images instead. And this is really what we see now that is happening. A lot of work of back in the 90s uh, being done today with modern stimuli like ImageNet and with modern neural networks like ContNets and LSTMs and the like. Um, and I want to say just, a f uh, a, I want to give a bit of an idea of why um, answering questions about symbolic data and drawing conclusions from this data to real language and to real perceptual stimuli um, has a bit of a disconnect. So for example, when we want to study emergent communication and we start from symbolic data, this symbolic data already, already encodes um, a lot of the structure about the world. It encodes, for example, what are the properties um, of the image. It encodes, for example, that there is a, um, a cat that has legs, et cetera, et cetera, because it's a binary, it's a binary vector. So, so when we do experiments and then we find that the messages that the agents started forming has structure, is this a big of a surprise? I would say probably not. Um, instead, when we do, when instead, if we would try to do all these experiments starting from real data, like from real images, we see now that there is the extra difficulty of, um, of starting from pixels and doing a concept formation. And for language and for communication, concept formation um, is an important step. Um, so working with multi-agent communication um, from real perceptual stimuli um, comes much closer um, to to how we learn and we use language and the type of data that we are exposed to. So this whole research of multi-agent communication uh, took another turn approximately four or five years ago. Um, and now the people um, got interested in seeing whether uh, this flexibility of having two agents that interact with each other could be used as a, as a building block for um, doing language learning. So this paradigm is very much inspired and shaped by the previous era research, um, but is using the modern experimental stimuli that we have today. So deep reinforcement learning and real vision in the experiments that this is relevant. So Interactive language learning. Um, this means that we want to go towards functional language learning. Um, in general, in language research, um, we see currently that um, people are interested in having 
agents that are able to use language in a more functional way, which means that have agents that, uh, that communicate about the intentions and the goals that they have, rather than, for example, having agents that are just able to um, do something unintentional, like classify an image or um, do language modeling, for example. And so the story here is that we see people getting interested in emergent communication as a way, um, as, as a way, or as something that can act as a scaffolding to natural language, as a way, for example, to do some form of um, pre-training. And if this is the story that people want to tell, then um, a question that becomes very relevant is to what degree the emergent languages that we would get out of uh, these agents interacting uh, are compositional and interpretable. And you can ask questions if you want. If you don't want, ah, yes. Could you tell us a bit more about what uh, emergent means? Uh, as opposed, is, is, it, uh, is it a way of uh, negating the non-intentional? No, so yeah. That's a very good point. Um, so by emergent, basically, we mean um, some communication protocol that comes out from agents, and this agent not having some pre-existing knowledge of language. So we get agents that we initialize them with random weights. There is nothing in there about language. We let them do things, and then we see an emergent protocol uh, so it's basically a protocol without a priori um, semantics. So we see now a lot of work, um, um, well, we see some work coming up from um, the emergent um, communication literature. And the basic, the, and, um, and all this communication really considers um, different language games. So they consider different um, situations where agents are, are placed to communicate uh, with each other. Um, in some of these um, games, agents are placed um, in an environment where they're asked to play a referential game. And I'm going to give a bit more information about that in a bit. But um, there are also other type of situations where um, people um, are trying to emerge this type of protocols. Um, they do this also in, 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 in a case of dialogue, where agents are exposed to different symbolic stimuli, and they are led to communicate with each other to achieve some goal-oriented something. Um, we see question asking on visual stimuli as well, a, uh, an agent trying to ask questions about another agent to play a game, um, like for example, the guess what game, um, and so on and so forth. Um, now I want to talk a bit about the emergent communication, emergent communication in referential game to get an idea about the concrete setup where uh, we could study uh, multi-agent communication. So, in a referential game, um, we have two players. We have the speaker and we have the listener. The speaker is presented um, with a target image. And on the other hand, the listener is presented with a collection of images. And one of, um, some of them are the distractors and one of them um, is the target. And all the listener needs to do is to identify the image. Now, the listener doesn't know which one is the target, so um, they need to rely on some information. And this information is going to come from, from the speaker. So the speaker is going to emit a discrete communication message, so basically a sequence of symbols. In this case, it would be very good, for example, if the speaker would encode um, in these discrete symbols, the information that the target is a pink ball. Like we would want something like this to come um, to emerge. Uh, and then the listener, given this um, communication message, is going to make a choice of which of the images is the target. And yes. 
What's a natural way? Like natural way in the sense that you're you're training neural networks, so you're just processing weights and sending numbers. But if you include the emission of symbols, then you're introducing an external factor that. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, I'm talking to you right now. Am I sending you? Um, I mean, wavelengths of things that I may. <laughs> So the point, okay, I mean, no, no, I want to say that this is a very good question and I get this question like approximately 95% of the times I give a talk. The reason why we want to introduce discrete symbols is because language is discrete. Like th there are, we have words basically. And if we want to study, what, language has words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in the representations that they form, can you recognize, like, I, I guess you you assume a symbolic representation because it would be easier to recognize so the, the I message, mean, right? When we study emergent communication, there are two things that, well, there is actually one thing that we want to make sure. We want to make sure that an agent cannot backpropagate all the way end to end on another agent, just because this is how we communicate. Like, I would wish to be able to back propagate through someone's brain, really, but this is not how things work. Um, now, and we, so the way we do it is we basically exchange some signals, and then you take the signal and then you do whatever you want with it. Um, for me, it's kind of reasonable to assume that this way of sending signals is in terms of discrete, um, discrete um, atoms just because I like to draw the parallel between words and symbols and then maybe, you know, sequence of symbols to sentences and then maybe we can see, for example, how, whether there is some internal structure in these messages. Um, so that's my hypothesis. Um, and I believe that this is a valid hypothesis if you want to look into language emergence and then if you want to assume that this is a framework that can lead to, na to language learning, which has words. Uh, yes, but very, 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 very good question, very valid question, yeah. Thank you. Okay, do I continue? Okay. Um, now, most importantly, most importantly, we see that most importantly, the, the meaning that these symbols have, they are, not um, the, they are not predefined. Like, at no point did I sit down to code what is A, what is B, what is AB. Um, instead, whatever semantics they come about in the communication protocol um, is emergent. In the beginning, there is no association between messages and objects, and through, through the learning, which I'm going to say in the next slide, through the learning, uh, the agents will, will start to associate symbols and utterances uh, with, with objects. Okay. Now, um, it, one slide to say how we would go about doing this with neural networks. Um, we would parameterize the speaker Basically, all these things are made up with very simple, um, with not simple, with um, off-the-shelf um, neural network modules. The speaker needs to process the image, so we give the speaker a confnet. Um, the speaker also needs to generate the message, so we give to the speaker an LSTM. Um, on the other hand, the listener needs to process images, we give them again a confnet, and the, the speaker needs to be able to process the protocol, the sequence of symbols that is coming from the speaker, and they have their own LSTM. Each of them has their own weights. There is no weight that is shared. And all that is being exchanged from the speaker to the listener is a sequence of discrete symbols. Um, if the speaker, if the listener, if the speaker has emitted an utterance that and had made the listener pick the right target, um, the listener and the speaker, they both get um, a reward of one. If, if, the, ta if the listener is 
not right, if the listener is wrong, they both get off, re off reward minus one. And now that we have a way to calculate rewards, we have weights, uh, we can start to do some learning. Um, and the way to do the learning here would be to use um, reinforce, then reinforce update rule, which is a way that we can do um, this type of learning when there is a discrete bottleneck between um, two, um, two learning components. There is also another trick that one could do, and to, um, that somebody could do to learn the system end-to-end -end through Gamble softmax trick. I'm just dropping things out. I'm not sure to what degree you're familiar with, but these things are in the slides. Um, the thing that is important here is to say that there is a way that we can do the learning. Basically, even in cases where we have discrete symbols and we cut the direct connection between the agents. Okay, uh, we talked a lot what works. Um, first of all, th the main thing for me, the main achievement here is that we are able to do all this research that people were doing in the past using five stimuli, each of them of size, I don't know, three, three uh, dimensions. We are able to now do all these things with realistic data. We can throw images, we can throw a lot of data, we can do many things. Um, and this really uh, is an exciting moment because we can now go back to the language evolution literature and we can, you know, take our reinforcement learning toolkit and do all these exciting experiments from the beginning in a larger, in a larger scale, um, closing this gap between experiments and realism. Yeah, and as I said, um, looking back into the literature, we can now have more realistic modeling. We can have agents equipped with context for visual processing, recurrences, we can have attentions. Uh, we can make, yeah, as I said, all this story more realistic. Um, there is a lot of things that are going on. There are a lot of weights, there are a lot of neural networks, um, a lot of uh, data. And even with all this complexity, we see that learning is happening. We see that agents are learning something. I'm going to talk in a bit about what they are learning exactly, but they, are, they do learn something. Um, yeah, so basically we have all this toolkit, we can now unleash it and, and see what else we can do. Um, we can start scaling up the research on language evolution. Okay. Whoops. I started this part saying that um, we are interested in emergent communication that can act as a scaffolding to natural language as a pre-training mechanism for example, and uh, it's important then for us to know whether these emergent languages have some of the properties that natural language has. The most important property is compositionality and it's interpretable, so it's good for us to go back and check whether, you know, our framework ticks um, these boxes. Um, we have a couple of challenges here, right? We need to go back and check for structure in the emergent protocols. So. I run my experiment, um, the learning curve, you know, went up, and then I go back and I see my agent saying AAA, BBB. Okay, what do I do now? <laughs> it's, no, it's not crystal clear whether there is some structure in there. Um, there, are, there, are ways, um, there are ways for us to diagnose this. Um, one, way would be, one way would be to present the agents in, to put uh, the agents in um, novel uh, situations and then see whether the language that they, ha they have come up with is able to generalize to these novel situations. The idea being that if I'm able, if I've broken the world into bits and pieces, even if somebody gives me a configuration of the world that has the same bits and pieces but in slightly different order, I'm still able to understand what is going on. So zero-shot performance is a proxy here. Um, the other thing that we can do is to check for isomorphism between the emergent, the emergent and um, the natural language. To see, for example, to what degree the, the emergent linguistic space, you can think of the, linguist, the emergent linguistic space as uh, a Euclidean space. Uh, to what degree this is a rotation of the natural language space. This is extremely simplified, but the idea is that we have vectors in the emergent language, vectors in the natural language. We can, you know, even consider it now as a 2D, see whether there is a way for me to map one to another. If there is a way for me to map one to another, it means that 
the emergent language covers some of the, con some of the semantics that the natural languages have. And there are also other more, uh, let's say, sophisticated measures that one could follow. But really the bottom line here is that we do need ways to measure structure in the emergent protocols. The next challenge is then, okay, we took our emergent language out. Um, we took it, here it is. How do I turn this into natural language? Um, it's not so easy, but again, there are a couple of ways that this can be done. Uh, we can. We, we can assume that we have some parallel stimuli. We have situations where a, uh, agents have, em have, crea um, have emitted some um, utterances and cases where we have natural language. And we can then take these things and throw them into the learning. So we can do, for example, now a multitask. We can think of a multitask framework where um, our agents not only need to communicate to achieve a common goal, but they also need to do um, some supervised natural language um, task. And this gives them a grounding. This, this is a, a possibility for them then to ground whatever symbol they communicate to natural language. Um, we can also do other things. If we have parallel stimuli, we can let the agents talk at emergent language, and then we can use um, machine translation techniques, for example, like a simple word alignment technique to align what the agents communicated about and how and, and what and with words, for example, in the natural language that we have for the similar situation. And we can also do more crazy things um, in, in the absence of, um, of parallel stimuli, um, which is to regularize the, um, the perplexity um, the perplexity of the emergent language under assuming that we have access to um, a language model trained on natural data. This is just to say that um, this is challenging, but we have some initial ways to close the gap between emergent language and natural language. Um, the main problem here, though, for me is that after we do all these things and after we do all this research, um, at the end of the day, we see that, um, look, emergent communication is unsupervised learning, like to put it simply. And we see that when we let agents communicate, for example, whether or not the protocols that they get out is compositional, is really, really much affected by the particular experimental configuration that we chose. For example, how many distractors um, in the referential game, how many distractors they had. Um, and this is not particularly positive. Um, again, in other research has has, um, have shown that whether or not compositional languages emerge um, depends on the right bias, not on the environment this time, but uh, on the agent's model. For example, people have shown that if it's not raining outside and if the agent's model has um, limited working memory, then we do see compositionality emerging. So it, 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 it makes things a bit more, um, what's the word? Well, not good, let's say. Um, importantly here, this is not a problem that is inherent to emergent communication and emergent language. This is really a problem that is inherent to any, um, it's, it's most, I think we, we mostly sit on any unsupervised um, method. Um, so, and um, there, is uh, th there is evidence also in the um, um, slightly related uh, research in the, uh, the field of disentanglement. Uh, it doesn't matter what disentanglement is at this point, but um, where people have found that um, the way that, um, the, the way that an, an agent um, structures, images, it's very much dependent on, on the seed and the model choice. So, yeah, basically when we do emergent communication, um, we, don't, we don't always get very consistent results. And this is currently something that um, bothers me and something that worries me and something that we need to find a way um, how to deal with. But this is not only, as I said, inherent to emergent language, it's everywhere in any parameterized model, deep learning, like it's the same story all over again. Um, so 
what this means is that basically that there is no freelance, um, and if we want to have compositional languages, um, the only safe way to do it is to add somewhere the right bias. So we need biases, basically. We can't do any type of meaningful learning without bias. And one way, for example, that we can have a meaningful bias drawn from like real language communication is very simply to not just have two agents constantly communicating with each other, but have um, a population of agents that then are said to communicate. And the idea there is that if we have more than two agents, but we have, let's say, 20 agents, um, that it's less probable for them to latch on something ad hoc because we increase the diversity of the capabilities of the agents. Um, and we can also draw, for example, and something that we see now happening, if we want to move, for example, towards languages that, have, that, are, that are more structured and compositional, uh, we see now research looking back, uh, in, back in the 90s, and trying um, things like cultural transmission as a way to, um, to take out protocols that are more structured. Okay, um, so that was that. And I guess I want to talk a bit about the last bit, which is to have uh, multi-agent communication as a way, yes, sorry, yes, sure. Uh, do all the previously mentioned uh, assume that all the agents uh, have access to the same knowledge. Do all the agents are, uh, know the same images, for example? Uh, because in real life, uh, two persons can communicate and know different things. One right. agent mm -hmm. can know less images than the other. So does the answer, uh, I don't know, or none of the ones I know uh, becomes valid in this context, in these games? Um, so yeah, that, that would be one way. Um, but now we see, like, if we would go to a more realistic setup where we had a population of agents, and maybe not just one game, but many different games, and agents would play different games and communicate with different partners, then this asymmetry of knowledge would come out very naturally, because each agent would have, would have been exposed to different partners and to different games. And, yeah, I guess we can always include the option that you just said to have them to just say, I don't know. Um, but currently the way that we, unfortunately that we do this research is that we, we have a stable partner, a stable set of agents that they expose to the very same stimuli. So there are, we can do better basically. And something like this would be a possibility. Yeah, I was wondering about the discreteness of the messages. And uh, no, I, mean, I think it makes perfect sense for written digitized language but i was thinking you know when i'm talking and sometimes even the way the sounds are i think if if i'm if i remember correctly for example in it's generally the case that uh, the word for large in many languages kind of has this ah or has this kind of sound there's some similarities and i'm wondering if it's an assumption that makes sometimes the the communication learning harder than it needs to be if you actually added some. So, so I, I'd imagine that you would, spoken language might be considered less discrete and more continuous. No, no, so no I mean, it's not considered. I mean, it is. Like, okay. spoken language is multidimensional. Okay. Um, and I do agree that by going down to discreteness, we are losing a lot of information. You know, when I talk, you can track even, you know, the tone of my voice when I'm not sure about something. Like, we encode a lot of information in the signal. Um, now, whether or not, this is true, whether or not we want to, like, day zero start with uh, emergent communication from, uh, uh, that, that's another question. I don't have an answer. It's like an empirical question. But I do agree that we want to move. Actually, we want to do natural language processing from, realistic stimuli and this is not always written text so we, we should yeah we should be doing that uh, so I have a question in the last slide um, you you expressed um, some disappointment that we need biases um, for compositionality but it doesn't 
to me, that seems natural, right? Like emergent language from humans comes from millions of years of evolution, right? We are biased. Evolution gives us that inductive bias, right? And have people actually studied that angle with emergent communication? So, I mean, in your particular case, you have a set of symbols and the vocabulary, I assume, is fixed to some set of symbols, right? And similarly, the architectures of the neural networks are also fixed, right? So throughout the emergence, none of that actually changes, right? Whereas in humans, the set of sounds that we could make change as our physiology change and our brain change shape over time. And so like our structures and our abilities to sort of convey those kinds of symbols changed over time. Is this something people think about or? About the changing aspect. Yeah, I mean, what is the impact? Like we, emer language emerged in humans alongside mm -hmm. our biological right. evolution, right? Mm -hmm. right? And so if we're going to study it, does it not make sense to, to think about those aspects yeah. as well? So, so I guess the concretely what, can, what I can take from that is this notion of, of generational training. Um, this is one way to interpret that. And the, this idea that learning doesn't only happen vertically within a generation, but also horizontally across generations uh, is actually um, one hypothesis that uh, people now try, not now, like people have been pursuing for many years, seeing to what degree this cultural transmission. So starting from example, for an, from an agent that doesn't know that much, and then the next generation is a step, is um, uh, starts from something that the first generation knew. Now, while the knowledge changes, um, we haven't seen a lot of work where there are more, let's say, discrete changes, like we add another unit or we add another layer. Um, so that we haven't really, really seen. But yeah, this cultural, the, thing, the, the notion that the, the next generation has something more than the previous generation didn't have. This people culture uh, pursue, and it has to do mainly with the knowledge rather than the architecture. So this is this cultural transmission aspect yeah, you mentioned. Yeah, for, for like, for, for it's one of the very, let's say, um, not, I don't want to say hot, but it's one of the prominent, yeah, it's one of the prominent theories of um, uh, language emergence and language evolution. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, just a few words about the la last bit on how can we use multi-agent communication to achieve better coordination um, among agents. The idea here is that at some point we might want to have multiple agents that exist in the environment and they all together need to solve um, a task. Um, and the hypothesis here is that communication in this type of cases where the intelligence is distributed among uh, several agents, communication um, is crucial for achieving um, better coordination. And these are, for example, um, well, two examples. In that, in, on the left one, you can think, for example, like just to make it a bit more natural language contextual, um, we have uh, a question, and then each of the, each of the systems is then um, sees some different books, some different part of the database, the question goes to one of the agents and then they kind of talk to each other to figure out, you know, complete the facts, um, yeah, complete the facts, see who has the answer. So this would be one way that we could potentially use um, communication in order to make processing distributed. So rather than having one monolithic agent who is going to be exposed to everything, we break the problem into smaller sub-problems and we let communication do its magic. Okay, and I guess the example that everybody gives, which is not uh, very NLP, is the self-driving cars. If we're going to have self-driving cars, um, like there might need to be some sort of coordination between um, these cars. Now, this doesn't need to be in the language, of course. <laughs> and yeah, okay. Um, and we've seen currently, like there is a plethora of papers who are tackling uh, these problems and they consider um, different setups. For example, um, in some, in some uh, of the research, we have agents that can only talk, they can't do anything else, so they, they don't move around. They can only talk, they exist in symbolic environments and uh, they all together need to solve uh, a cooperative task. Uh, and we can have 
a very similar case, but now agents that can not only talk, but they can also move. Uh, and that actually introduces uh, yet another complexity to the whole multi-agent communication problem. Um, the point being that one can also communicate with their actions rather than their words, and then taking out protocols from agents that can um, also walk around is kind of challenging. Um, then we can have uh, multi-agent communication in cases where agents that they need to cooperate exist in um, virtual 3D environments. And then we can also increase the dimension on another complexity. We can have agents now that exist in simple environments, but they don't really share the same goal. They're not cooperative. And having communication in this type of cases is not only difficult and challenging, but is also crucial because it's a very realistic setup. Like we, like we as humans, were able to communicate with each other, and we are not constantly uh, cooperative. Like we don't constantly want to achieve the same reward. So how do we do that? Um, yeah, and other variants of this work. Um, even more variants. We can have semi-cooperative agents in 3D environments. Um, so really, like people do get interested um, in this. Um, type of questions. Um, however, um, speaking about um, engineering challenges, like multi-agent communication is, like fr from a learning perspective, is actually, it, it's quite tough. Um, it's tough to do learning when you have one agent learning. It's twice as tough <laughs> to have, to do learning when you have two agents learning at the same time. And the problem is because uh, because we, we are in a case where when an agent is learning, there is non-stationarity in the, in the environment. The agent learns something, and at the next time step, the environment, whoa, the environment has changed. Um, this makes the problem of joint exploration um, quite difficult. And one example is, for example, we can have an agent A and B that are both learning at the same time. Uh, so they are both learning to talk and listen at the same time, right? So all of these things are learned jointly. Now at the beginning of the training, the messages are meaningless, they're random, but the learners, they're trying to, to they're really trying hard to, in, to interpret the messages. Now you have uh, an agent who is basically receiving streams of nonsense from another agent who is learning at the same time. So the easiest thing then to do would be to instead of listening to this nonsense that is coming through the communication signal, which is ungrounded and has emergent semantics, is to instead uh, communicate in the action space. And what we see happening uh, all the time is that agents that are both learning to speak and talk because learning to assign semantics to emergent language that doesn't have grounding to anything, um, is tough, the agents actually end up communicating on the action space. So in one of these 3D environments, we see that agents essentially are doing the bee dancing to communicate um, with other agents, which is fascinating, but if we want to study um, languages, again, it's yet another difficulty. Yeah, so basically agents just ignoring the language altogether. Okay, do agents really communicate in all these experiments, in all these cases? Sometimes we, we see that there is some optimal use of the um, communication channel. And again, we need to have a way to measure communication. Um, so what seems to be happening is that agents appear to be communicating, but there is no useful information being transmitted in the communication channel. Um, so there is basically limiting posi limited positive signaling. Agents don't talk in a meaningful way. And there is limited positive listening. Agents don't seem to be uh, really paying attention. Um, can we do better? Well, I hope we can. And uh, here, human communication can provide inspiration for useful inductive biases. Uh, for example, like um, what we can do is that we can force agents to adhere into Grecian semantics, like force the agents to really treat communication as communication rather than as just a sequence of symbols. Um, what, are we what are we learning? Um, sometimes we don't really learn a lot. Um, 
it's although it's not always necessary to have uh, protocols that are interpreted it, that are interpretable it's always good to, to to know what exactly is going on when agents are communicating oops um, so one one way to go about here would be to either start from language early on in the emergent communication phase put the inductive bias of language itself bake it into the learning of, of the multi-agent communication from the very beginning. Um, that's one way. Or another way would be to have post-training experiments um, for testing uh, different communication hypotheses. Try to probe into the representation of the agents and see what are they communicating about. Um, oops. Okay, uh, final slide. These are my key takeaways, like my two cents if you like. Um, first of all, Multi-agent communication need bias, biases as well. Uh, we see that human-centric intelligence is key inspiration for like a lot of computation out there. Convolutional networks, genetic algorithms, you name it. I don't really see why multi-agent communication cannot look into linguistic communication that you know, is out there and is happening um, for inspiration of inductive biases. So even if this might be, an, um, a, let's say, machine learning or engineering uh, topic, um, we have proof by existence. We have human language and human communication. Um, this is a general remark, but we need uh, metrics, metrics, metrics. When we do things in multi-agent communication, we need to have a way to quantify what's going on. We need to be able to measure what the agents are learning, how structured their protocols are, what are the concepts that humans are, uh, th sorry, that agents are communicating? How much communication is really happening? If we just observe one number, if we just observe the performance in the task, we don't really have an understanding of what is really is going under the hood. And I guess this is not only uh, specific to multi-agent communication, it's, I guess, anything, um, like any type of learning. Like, we can't just rely on one final number. Um, finally, it's crucial if we want to go forward in any of these directions, uh, we need to be able to interface it with natural language. Um, not only for reasons of interpretability and debugging, but also if we really want multi-agent communication to have wider applicability um, to, for example, language learning or things like a human-agent communication or even transfer learning. Like We need to be able to close the gap between emergent communication and natural language. So if I managed in this hour, if I managed in this hour to get you excited um, about the field, which I hope I did. Okay. Um, what can you do? Um, you can skim through the papers that I have in the slides and give me one day to add proper references, like add links to the papers. Um, if you want to get uh, your hands uh, dirty, you can start using the Egg Toolkit by the Facebook AI Research that implements a couple of language games, um, implements uh, some simple learning between agents, and it has neural networks as well. So it's easy to get started with this research really fast. Um, you can also have, you have one day, if you look at the papers and you use the toolkit, to submit uh, a paper in our um, emergent communication workshop at NeurIPS with deadline tomorrow. I mean, why not? 24 hours. Uh, Um, but this is, I mean, I'm not here av advertising the workshop to submit so much, but it's mainly to, 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 to pass the, the point that this is a community, it's not just me talking here, um, giving a talk, it's an emerging, it's an emerging topic, and um, yeah, we have a workshop, the third workshop this time at NeurIPS. And um, yeah, and um, emergent communication, multi-agent communication review is underway. Uh, I'm writing it and stay tuned. It should be out around February. And on that note, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'd like to thank Agedeki for the great talk, and here's a present on behalf of the organizing committee and the summer school. Uh, and we have time for a couple of questions. Has someone, when trying to the game where one, one agent processes an image and the other one has to decipher which one was it, has, has some work been done in which 
the, f the first agent first learns how to, it, they don't learn at the same time simultaneously, so that the, the first one learns the representations however he wants to do it, or it, and, and then once it has a more structured way of mm -hmm. the, the second one, because I guess that that's how language works actually, no? Like we get to know the representation of concepts by someone that has already a concept in their head. Yeah, so basically um, this is a, like let's say one of the two ways that people have studied these questions. The first one is when you do multi-agent communication at the same time, the language games, and the other way is exactly the one you are describing is, I had it in the beginning, it's what I called observational learning, but it's exactly that idea that you have the teacher, the teacher has learned the language somehow, uh, secretly the, act the teacher has learned the language from the previous teacher, uh, and now the teacher, who has already some, uh, some way of conceptualizing the world, no matter how easy, no matter how correct or wrong it is, it passes on the knowledge in a kind of noisy way um, to the student. And then, you know, repeat uh, until, you know, forever, until AGI, until artificial intelligence is out. But, yeah. uh, it be, like, this is one of the main... Uh, Does it work different, like... Is it improving any kind so of... So people have done experiments, uh, a lot of experiments actually with humans, um, simulating the very same hypothesis with humans in cases, like not with natural language, but with uh, um, synthetic languages. And with humans, it seems that uh, like the more you go down the, the generation, like let's say after 10 generations, it seems that languages become more structured. Now there is like a huge confounder in this type of experiments because we as humans, we have a bias, a huge bias for compositionality. Um, so we have these experiments with humans, but um, now we see people picking up this uh, research again, and now uh, there are a couple of papers that are coming out the next, uh, the very next few weeks or months, where they try to replicate um, the same experimental hypothesis, but with neural networks. Um, it seems that it's adding something that training one network on its own and then training the second on the first and then the, the third on the second. It seems to be adding a bit of structure, um, well, in, in, the, in, the co in the communication protocol, but it's still the beginning. Like, we, we are going to see more research on that. But it seems to be having a small effect. Like the very first experiment that I actually did, um, I played the game, like it was a slightly different game. And um, uh, I played the game with the two agents and with, um, with, with images. And I figured out the agents only needed two, two symbols to communicate about a thousand images. Um, it turns out that they were talking about pixel intensity. <laughs> um, so this is not particularly encouraging. Um, so yeah, basically, if you let agents communicate end-to-end, uh, -end, they're going to learn the optimal, whatever is optimal to play the game. Um, in some cases, you know, the pixel might be one, and this is actually why I emphasize that we need deductive biases. Like, we as humans, we don't communicate with pixels. Um, there, there should be a good reason for that. Um, and the question is, how can we make experiments more realistic so that this kind of behavior doesn't uh, emerge? Okay, thank you for your presentation, first of all. Uh, one question, the whole concept of uh, multi-agent communication on a very high level seems to resemble a little bit the, this one of uh, the generative adversarial networks, where you have uh, one uh, network actually generating something and one trying to discriminate between uh, what's being generated. Uh, is this approach or a version of uh, a gun-based approach being considered in your domain? Is it something that is uh, under development? Have you considered, uh, for example, uh, something that uh, involves gun uh, models in your, uh, in your research? Because it seems pretty much identical uh, from a very high level standpoint. Yeah, so basically there are many common components there that you have two modules that are learning at the same time. Um, like you don't need to go as far as GANs, right? You can go as far as autoencoders, uh, right? Like this framework is really um, 
uh, a glorified uh, autoencoder. The reason why we call it um, multi-agent communication, where it's not just autoencoder, like we have discrete bottleneck, but it's like for us also to, to like, you know, look a bit, like in, start thinking of things in a slightly uh, different way. So this is one, one thing. I, I guess the main difference between the GAN and this framework is that GAN is um, it's a zero sum game, whereas in, in, the, in the frameworks that we've looked in particular, um, we have uh, cooperative frameworks. This is one thing. And the second thing is that we want to be able to um, um, emerge in communication protocol. We've done a lot of experiments where agents are competing, so have communication in cases where we have zero-sum games. And still, up, uh, still until today, we are not able to have agents assign semantics to communication with, when they don't share the same reward. Um, so I hope this answers the question. But basically, yeah, there are many commonalities. Thank you very much for the talk. It, it's, it's a really interesting uh, domain. What I was, I wanted to ask a, a bit of a broad question about semantics. Um, so in general, in NLP, we provide the semantics, right? Like the humans, because we are in the loop. Um, but obviously, in communication, we come kind of biased towards that to know that language m means something, right? That, that there is meaning to what we say and that, that there is this external world. Is the idea of this kind of research that somehow you want the agents to reproduce that uh, or in some way learn to have representations in a way that eventually the human will not have to be in the loop and then you could have not only syntax but semantics or is that just too far-fetched? I guess one, one reason why we would want to do this research is to see, for example, whether, um, whether networks that are exposed to similar data as humans do, they create the semantics, the concepts um, that humans would assign to the same um, stimuli. So this, for example, one reason why we might want to do something like that. If I think it's possible. Um, yeah, so, like, I'm not, okay, so you're talking about grounding and all these things. Like, I'm not, like, I'm not sure if, you know, this framework is powerful enough to emerge, to, to, to give rise basically to, to the, the, the semantics with the same complexity and realism as the natural language, or uh, as the semantics that humans assign. Um, this is one thing. However, I do think that we can, it can maybe, you know, close the gap between no semantics and full semantics. Um, so, uh, like, if, if I want, like, for me, this whole framework of multi-agent communication is really a way that allows us to either do unsupervised learning, maybe inspired a bit more from how communication works, or if unsupervised learning doesn't work, maybe it's a, it's a way for us to, to do semi-supervised learning. So seed the agents with a bit of semantics and then let interaction take on uh, to propagate the semantics um, you know, into other concepts. So I don't think it's the full answer, but I don't think it's completely useless as well. So, but you know, we still need to see what's the best way to, to use that framework. <laughs> 